If you know my fondness for the book of Revelation, it may come as no surprise that this reading from Daniel is one of my favorites. The lectionary today leaves out the gory details. Kafkaesque monsters rising from the sea with multiple heads and wings and brutal tusks, talking horns, oblique references to obscure historical references. It allows the summary to suffice. As for me, my spirit was troubled within me. That pretty well gets to the heart of it. What's interesting is that I was blessed this week to be a part of another troubling conversation. Some folks approached me with a question about the psalm that we just sung, uh, particularly the bits about the two-edged sword and iron fetters and wreaking vengeance upon the nations. They were troubled because this kind of language doesn't seem to fit in a psalm in which we are praising God. How can we praise the God that we know, the God of love and grace and mercy, while singing about the defeat and death of others? It's interesting because of the way, the way that the lectionary works. You see, the psalm is chosen as a response to the first reading, which in this case today is Daniel. While the story from Daniel is ostensibly about monsters and angels and cosmic judgment, it's actually about a very specific political situation that existed in Judea about a century and a half before Jesus' time. You're familiar with the Jews going into captivity in Babylon. Well, Babylon was conquered by the Persians, and when that happened, the Persians allowed the, allowed the Jews to go home. The Persians were then, in turn, uh, conquered a few centuries later by Alexander the Great, who died uh, of malaria before he could even finish conquering everything. And after his death, his empire was split among four generals, creating four smaller empires, each with a different ruling dynasty. The story we read today, while it's set during the Babylonian exile, was written during the time of the rule by the Greek-speaking Seleucid dynasty, and specifically under the reign of a king named Antiochus, Antiochus IV. Now, Antiochus had no love for the Jewish people. He didn't hate them per se, but he didn't want them to be different. He wanted them to assimilate. And so he enacted a number of policies that made it very hard to be Jewish. Things like outlawing circumcision and erecting a statue of Zeus, Zeus excuse me, a, a statue to Zeus in the Jewish temple. In other words, he was just about the worst thing to happen to Judea since the Babylonians. The author of the book of Daniel does not treat Antiochus kindly. He was well known to be arrogant, a little too big for his britches. He fought numerous wars to expand his territory. The author of Daniel portrays him as a horn on the head of one of these four beasts, and specifically a little horn speaking arrogantly. I read that and I see a very on-the-nose political cartoon. In Daniel's vision, this little horn goes on spouting threats and violence, seemingly oblivious to the judgment taking place upon it by the Ancient of Days who casts it into the fire, where it goes on boasting and threatening while the body upon which it's attached is burned up. In a context like this, maybe you can start to see why someone would write a psalm in praise of God that includes the violent conquest of God's enemies. Maybe it sounds a little bit more reasonable that someone would want the people who oppressed them to experience what they've experienced to put the shoe on the other foot, so to speak. But maybe this still makes you a little uneasy because you know that revenge is not the same thing as justice. That making others suffer what they've, been, what they've made others to suffer doesn't bring about peace. So maybe you're a little bit more receptive to Jesus' words today about loving your enemies. As hard as that is to do, it at least fits with who we know God to be, right? Maybe it's much easier to get on board with blessing those who curse us and praying for those who abuse us, at least in theory, than it is to wish them ill or to triumph over them. But is it really? Because of the way the calendar works, All Saints Sunday always falls within a week of Election Day in the U.S. Uh-oh. 
That means whenever these stories are read, we are always within seven days of a change in our government. Some years that change is more substantial than others, but it's always there. And I know this year, I have been particularly deluged with the flood of voicemails and text messages and emails or mailers from candidates who are filling my eyes and my ears with rhetoric that sounds an awful lot like Daniel's vision of monsters. That's what makes apocalyptic literature so powerful. Even when it's written in a specific context like this, it's perennially true because it's fundamentally about the human condition. There will always be monstrous governments and arrogant leaders that are too big for their britches. There will always be real people who suffer because of the policies and the opinions of those in power. There will always be those of us who hope and pray that those leaders will just go to be with Jesus. We will always want to triumph over our enemies because we believe that that is the way to achieve victory and to solve the problems of the world. In other words, we will always be exactly like the people we hate. Last weekend, we celebrated Reformation Sunday. You might remember there was a lot of red. One of the core tenets of the Reformation, one of the key observations that Luther made is that we are all of us, both saint and sinner. Each and every one of us reveals, both reveals God to the world as a bearer of God's image and a recipient of God's grace, as well as actively rejecting that God and that grace to go our own way. And there is perhaps no greater example of this than Luther himself, who not only sparked the Protestant Reformation and brought us a new understanding of God, but who was also a raging anti-Semite calling for the extermination of Jewish people. The same man that we quote on Reformation Sunday was quoted from the Reichstag as justification for the Holocaust. I'm glad that Luther is our role model. I'm glad because it's his very brokenness that illustrates his point, that we are all simultaneously saints and sinners that God loves and accepts and even saves us in exactly that state of ambiguity. We want to separate those things out to differentiate between the sheep and the goats, but the reality is it can't be done. When we elect or follow leaders who promise to overcome evil with good, we so often find that the blessings that we are so eager to offer the world are simply woes in disguise. I don't know who's going to win on Tuesday in each of these races, but I can promise you that no matter who wins, there are going to be a great many people who are very disappointed, even to the point of despair over the outcome. Not because they are good people or because they are bad people, but because we are all people, all of us, all the same. Each and every one of us, if we have not done so already, should go out and vote our conscience and our values. But when those results are tallied, we also should remember that regardless of the outcome or the effect that outcome has on the world around us, the holy ones of the Most High shall receive and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. Because that kingdom doesn't come at the point of a sword. As I mentioned earlier, All Saints Day is a feast began as a feast to remember the people who had lived and died as saints and martyrs whose names were never recorded. It wasn't until the Reformation and Luther's observation that we began to realize that to be a saint, to be one of God's holy ones, isn't about piety or good works or virtuous living. What makes one a saint is that God is visible in that person. A saint shows us shows others something of God. Martin Luther was a saint, even as a hate-filled, cantankerous old man. Antiochus IV was a saint. He showed the Jewish people a new way to experience God's hope. 
Just because they fantasized about roasting him alive doesn't change that. This is one of the challenges in our scripture today, not to imagine a God whom we praise by wreaking bloody vengeance on our enemies, but to imagine a God who makes us one with them. When Jesus calls us to love our enemies, he's inviting us not just to refrain from hurting them, he's inviting us to learn from them who God is. Even sinners can be saints. Even enemies of God can show us God. Even hunger and poverty and sorrow can be blessings in disguise because they reveal something of God to those who have ears to listen. And that, I think, is the real power behind All Saints Day. It's not about remembering our dead loved ones, but about thinking how they made God known to us and then wondering how God might be made known to us in other people, the ones we'd sooner not remember. One of the reasons we make a point of receiving new members into the congregation on this day is because of this truth. We welcome people into this community, and we're excited to get to know them, but the truth remains that we will disappoint one another. That's going to happen when we are petty or thoughtless, at the point where our welcome ends, there God is revealed just as surely as when we extend grace or mercy. In any other community, we can avoid or cut off the people that hurt us, but not here. Here, we are forced to come to this table with them every week. Even when we're angry, or disappointed in one another. We're forced to remember that God makes us one, that God is in all of us. It is our brokenness, it is in our brokenness, that the wholeness of God becomes most evident. And that's what we're celebrating today. That's what we remember. We remember that our brokenness, our shortcoming, our defeat, tells God's story because only in those things can we find forgiveness and grace and mercy and reconciliation, things we would never experience if we all got along all the time. Even our sins shine with the light of God, just like these problematic verses from the Psalms can still proclaim God's greatness and cause us to praise God. What I take from these texts today is that no matter what monsters might inhabit the places of power, or even the dark corners of our own hearts, we always have the opportunity and the ability to proclaim and to live the goodness and the healing of God's kingdom. Because that kingdom belongs to us God's holy ones forever, forever and ever.